Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to our uh, department seminars. It's actually the formal seminar, the first one for yeah. this semester. Yeah. First form. Yeah, first form. <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to introduce this speaker, Echo Mani. Echo uh, has uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota with uh, uh, in the English major, mm -hmm. and has been working in our department for five years. Already. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Huh? So. Uh, <laughs> That's what uh, she says. She ran a uh, uh, communication <coughs> associate in our department. Does a lot of work, and uh, so today she's going to uh, introduce us to do a workshop about how the accessibility and uh, uh, you know, how you can make it part of your everyday app for digital accessibility. Okay, uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, the workshop is Habitual Accessibility. Um, if you have a laptop and want to download any of the stuff that we're working on, including the, uh, the PowerPoint, you can. It's just at z.umn.edu slash habitual accessibility. Um, you don't need to. We're going to go over everything uh, via the computer, but I just wanted to make sure that if you wanted that option, you have it. Uh, so, first, I'm presenting, my title doesn't give a whole lot of good reason as to why I am presenting, uh, which is why I wanted to give a little bit of background on, on how this happened. <laughs> uh, so a couple of years ago, I started doing the Equity and Diversity Certificate Program, which I finished last year. Um, it's a great program, but it's very broad. Uh, all sorts of different things concerning equity and diversity. And a lot of what I brought back to it was, OK, how can I apply this to the horticulture department uh, and my job in communication specifically? Which is why I started focusing a lot on our communications and our digital accessibility specifically. Uh, so I did a six-week digital accessibility course. And I thought that it was really helpful that it actually showed me not just like, oh, you're supposed to do X or Z. Uh, but actually showed me, okay, here's an instruction list. Go do it yourself. <laughs> um, it made it a lot easier. I didn't have to search other places. Uh, and since I want the department to be more accessible overall, I thought I would pass that information on to all of you. Um, and it is helpful outside of the department as well, of course. Accessibility isn't just a department issue. It's something that sort of shows up everywhere we're, we go. So. What is accessibility? Uh, in a nutshell, accessibility means making your, your document or your project usable by people of all abilities. Uh, a lot of people get it confused with usability, which is often the goal uh, when you create a program or a document. A good example that I saw is a, a chair. A chair might be usable for a specific person, such as that one, for instance. For some people, it's going to be too short. For some people, it's going to be too tall. It might be uncomfortable. But there is one specific set of people that that chair works for. And for them, it is usable. Uh, whereas the chairs, more like we have here, are a little bit more accessible. They don't have arms, so it doesn't matter what size you are. They're decently comfortable, not too comfortable. Most people can sit in them without too much of an issue. Um, it's hard to catch everybody in any sort of accessibility thing you do because it's always a moving target. Uh, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> so the goal of today is to give you some of the tools to build accessibility practices into your everyday work. We're going to be focusing specifically on Microsoft Word and Google Docs pretty heavily uh, with a little bit of a tangent onto PowerPoint and PDFs. The nice thing is that most of the stuff that you learn for Microsoft Word translates to all of the other Microsoft Office tools. Uh, they all look pretty similar. I tried doing some between PowerPoint and Excel, uh, and it was the same steps. So I figured, why rehash it? Uh, what this isn't, it's not a lecture on the ADA, or American Disabilities Act, um, or a legal discussion. I don't know any of that stuff. Uh, I can't help you. <laughs> I tend to lean more on the side of, if, if it's reasonable and you can do it, why not try to make somebody's life easier? So when do you actually have to make a document accessible? Uh, essentially, if the 
group who will see the document is either unknown or will change in the future, it's not just kind of required to make it accessible, it's really helpful to everyone involved. Um, if it's just for you or if it's for you know, your lab group, for instance, you generally know the makeup of your lab group and what their particular needs are. If they don't need something that's accessible, you don't have to do it. That being said, this is called habitual accessibility for a reason. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to making a document accessible beyond just the fact that it is then accessible to people, uh, particularly focusing on screen readers or people with mobility issues. That's what digital accessibility tends to help the most with, uh, which I looked up a statistic and is like 15% of the U.S. population. <laughs> uh, so it's not, that's not insignificant, uh, which is why we're going to talk a little bit about the why. Um, doing, uh, making your documents accessible is essential for some, but useful for everyone. Uh, what I have noticed in particular is that it simplifies a lot of my documents and my thought processes when I'm making new things. It's a lot of the things that make a document accessible are based on hierarchy, uh, and so it makes you really stop and go, okay, you know, this is getting a little overcomplicated. How can I make this simpler so that people can actually understand my information regardless of whether or not they have a disability? Um, many of the features that make a document accessible also help with other features such as indexing, making tables of contents, changing a document, search engine optimization, uh, etc. A, a lot of what we're going to go over today also applies to the web, but that is a much bigger topic that as staff, faculty, and graduate students, you don't have a lot of control over at the university that's mostly dictated by CFANS. Um, and also, you two will get old. <laughs> uh, at some point, you know, you're going to have trouble moving around, trouble seeing. There are going to be issues that pop up. So if you start working on this now, you're essentially making the future what you hope it will be. It saves time. I have spent far too long converting documents that were made with tables into something that is much more accessible because tables inherently are not. They seem very structured and useful, but they are actually kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, and you don't want to have to reformat all your course materials, for instance. <laughs> uh, um, and we already manually do a lot of the things that accessibil accessibility methods do automatically. Um, a really good example is making a pretty much any Word document. A lot of them tend to look accessible, but are not, which we'll go into more reasons on that later. Uh, and finally, be a good human. Not everyone wants to tell you li their life story. They don't have to tell you their life story. There could be somebody who has a minor issue that, you know, it, it takes them a couple extra minutes to maybe go through the process of making something easier for them. Or, you know, if that's built in, it, they don't have to worry about it. And you save yourself time later. I also am firmly in the camp that accessibility is about participation, inclusion, and equality. Uh, and information is a civil right. As a university, we pump out information all the time. And theoretically, we want people to know what we're doing here. So by making your documents and all their various forms accessible, you're opening it up well, even just the ones that use screen readers, that's 15% of the population uh, it who previously might have struggled with what you were doing. All right, so is it accessible? Looks can be deceiving, as you might have gathered from some of what I've said already. So we're going to do a, a show of hands. I've got two documents here. One of these was created accessibly, one was not. They look very similar. They were used for the exact same purposes. So, show of hands, who thinks the one on the uh, left is accessible, the medicinal, medicinal cannabis one? Got a few. Okay. The, how about the right one? Who votes for the right one as the accessible one? A few people as well. Not quite as many. The ones who raised their hands for medicinal cannabis were correct. I changed the dates just so you couldn't tell which time in the seminar series that one happened. Uh, because that was partway through the year when I learned how to make PDFs accessible. Uh, how about this one? 
The one on the left. Who thinks the one on the left is accessible? OK. The one on the right? A few more hands, but most people are, are kind of abstaining from this one. They look like almost the exact same document. <laughs> Uh, and it makes it really hard to know, unless you know what to look for. Uh, the one on the right is accessible, uh, which hopefully you'll be able to identify a little bit more later. I, put, I only put one clue in here, and that was the, uh, the headers. So it's clicked on there, that says heading one, whereas this one clicked on here says heading three. And that'll be like the first core skill we'll get to, so that will make more sense in a moment. So, the how. Uh, we're going to go over the six core skills. Interspersed in there is going to be sort of a demonstration on what it is I'm actually doing. Um, again, primarily focusing on Word, Google Doc, uh, with some, some PowerPoint, mostly mentioned, uh, and PDFs. One thing I really want to note is that we're, we're throwing these six core skills at you. Doing all of them can take a lot of time and be a little bit frustrating, but feel free to choose one. Uh, doing these six core skills uh, can reduce accessibility barriers by about 80% just by doing this. And this is the easy stuff. Uh, there are, in fact, some slides that I'll just sort of breeze through because you probably already do them. Uh, or if you don't, they're pretty easy to implement. We're going to start with the trickiest one, though. Uh, not necessarily tricky, one that takes the most explanation. Headings and formatting. Uh, so this is the big one that I've tried to put into uh, all of our documents. This is essentially document structure. You are using Word to say, OK, this is heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four. Uh, you can think about it a lot like an outline, and it, in fact, is what creates a table of contents uh, when you make a Word document. So, you know, you start with uh, A, and then there's text, and then Roman numeral one, text. That would be, if you made your outline, that would be heading one, two, three, and four. It's really important to use them not for decoration. <laughs> That's where a lot of people mess up with that, is that they're, they're like, oh, you know, if I use heading three, it's about the right size that I want it, or it's the right color, uh, it's bold, whatever it may be, they decide that that is the one that they want. Um, but that is really unhelpful in a lot of ways, which is why I'm going to show you how to change that. <laughs> um, the appearance of headings does not mean it's heading a heading. So if you take something and you make it size 16 and bold and yellow, that's great. If you listen to it through a screen reader, it just looks like text. They're like, oh, yeah, you made another paragraph. Congratulations. Uh, so it's really important to actually use the headings. Um, this applies mostly to Word, Google Docs. Uh, also, if you're making any websites, it applies to that. Um, and it's kind of an inherent part of PDFs. You don't go in and manually select a PDF. It's weirdly enough, as I discovered while making this PowerPoint, it's not a thing on PowerPoints. <laughs> um, you kind of just have to use whatever the template gives you, make sure you have your title, and then bullet points are your friend, uh, is more or less what I learned. Um, so for formatting, Use the program to style your formatting. Don't do it manually. And so now we'll go into a little bit of how to actually do that. Echo, I have a quick question about PowerPoint. Yes. If you're using templates and you use like the title bar and stuff like that, does that title bar show up in an outline? Like, Would that be helpful if you're using the title bar in the template as opposed to just making your own willy-nilly type Yes. Boxes? Using what the template gives you is is usually helpful, assuming that you got the template from a reputable place, such as from Microsoft Word. If you download one off the internet, it might be iffy, depending on what the person who made it knows. Mm -hmm. um, but anything you use from Microsoft will be accessible. Uh, and they actually do recommend on your title card 
every card should have a different title. Even if it's just a little bit different, it helps with sorting through when you're doing a screen reader. So, this is my nice example Word document uh, where I put in some text and some links. Uh, so it's really easy to make a, a heading. All you have to do is highlight it. Your headings are all over here. Up there if you can't see it. Uh, and then there's the style panes, which basically pops everything out. You can see some more of the different ones. So we want this one to be heading one. Highlight this. This is heading two. This is also heading two. OK, so that's it. It's really easy. Uh, uh, the other benefit is that, uh, remember like I was saying before, you know, your heading doesn't look quite how you want it to. You want it to be bolded or a different size. So let's see. We've got heading two here. We want this to be bold and, yeah, red works. Red. OK, so I changed that one heading. I do not have to go through and change every heading in my document, which I'm sure for all of you working on theses would be a nightmare. <laughs> uh, if you go over here to your style panes, which is, again, up there in the corner of the top right, click on the arrow and do Update to Match Selection. And then it's changed your headings throughout the rest of the document. As you can see down there, it changed heading two. And you can do this for all of them including normal text. Um, for instance, if you decide at some point that you want all of your text to be single spaced instead of 1.5 like I have it, you just change one paragraph how you want it, go over to normal, and do update to match selection. Um, that becomes a little bit more important when you're talking about line spacing, um, which you can find up here with the nice arrows line spacing options, if you want space before or after a paragraph, it is not recommended to use the return bar to make a double space, which is what most people do and what I've done for most of my life. Uh, it's a lot better as far as listening to it with a screen reader. It will read off every space that you put in regardless of whether or not it's decorative. Whereas if you use this, uh, you can say, you know, I want a ton of space. You do that, again, update to match selection, and it puts it through your whole document. What I would not recommend doing, at least this is just my opinion, you can go in and you can modify style, but it limits what you can do for some reason. Uh, I find it a lot easier to just do one and then update to match selection. It seems to work a lot more smoothly. It's almost identical in Google Doc. Um, again, it says normal text up here uh, by where you'd select your font. You just select the heading that you want, whatever that heading may be. If you want to change it, so we're going to make that bold, you just click on the arrow and do update heading two to match. And then all of your documents will match that throughout. And that that is step one. That is what I think, at least, the easiest thing you can do to make your documents accessible is use your headings, use them wisely. I've, and the reason I've found them particularly useful is because they've helped me to sort of, like I said before, retrain my brain. I make things a lot simpler, move paragraphs around to make them clearer, because when I'm trying to fit them into this mold, you have to. And it ultimately helps you make a more cohesive document. Yes. When you when you are calling that more accessible, mm -hmm. what does it mean to be more accessible? I've heard you talk about screen reader. Uh, you've talked about organization, so is it a visual presentation of order? Mm -hmm. yes. Is it possible for someone who uh, may have some uh, visual challenges to change all They I'm could. Interested in what you mean by accessible? How, how you're judging whether something is more accessible? Yeah, and that's a great question. Uh, how how you actually judge whether something's more accessible? Um, essentially, <coughs> it's uh, making it so that it can be changed easily. 
It's like if you think of an ebook, um, when you're reading an ebook on your Kindle or your Nook, you can change the font size and whatnot very easily. And that's, it's kind of the same thing with screen readers. Like if somebody is completely blind, they can use a screen reader, which does like a voiceover um, that will read through the document for them. And it lets them, by using headings in particular, they can select what they want to listen to. So they can just go through the headings instead of having to go through the entire document. So if you've got you know, a five-page course syllabus, for instance, uh, if you're not using headings on that course syllabus, somebody who is using a screen reader to access that has to listen through the entire document to get to page four, uh, where there's information that they actually want. Uh, whereas by using headings, it lets them scan it, just like you'd scan a table of contents. Um, the screen reader will just go for heading one is X, heading two is Y, um, and it makes everything a lot faster and a lot easier. Yeah? If you had a Word document syllabus with headings and you saved it as a PDF, would someone with a screen reader, read screen reader using the PDF be able to see the headings? Probably, and we'll get to PDFs later. I've got a slide dedicated to PDFs. <laughs> uh, because like I, PDFs, uh, if you make a document accessible, PDFs will usually be accessible. There are a couple of extra steps you can take to make PDFs more accessible, um, but there's sort of yes and no inherent. <laughs> uh, Steffi. I would like to tell you here too because I love headings, and whenever I get a manuscript from someone else that is like 30 pages long, I don't know if I can read what the subtitles are, I get crazy and I'm so excited about getting what just told us. But that's another trick if you go back to your Word document. And yes. You go to view. There's that navigation thing where you can put in a check mark. Um, the left. left. Ah, navigation yeah. pane. <laughs> um, and now go on the second tab that just opened, and it tells you, okay, heading one is X, 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 and then so you can see the whole structure of the document. And uh, for someone who also gets easily confused, I think that's also a nice special aid, even if you don't need it. Yes, definitely. And that transfers over to PDF, too, um, so which is why like headings are my favorite. <laughs> You had a question? Yeah. Um, do screen readers work specifically with Word, or is this just sort of a general principle that you could use if you were, say, using LaTeX? It's a general principle that you can use with any program. Um, different programs have different ways of working with screen readers. It can be a little complex, particularly if you don't use a screen reader, like myself, I don't. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I'm not entirely sure if the specific program you might be interested in using would be considered accessible. Um, for instance, I was trying to do a chat thing with somebody who uh, was visually impaired. And she was like, oh, we can't use Discord because Discord isn't accessible, but the Slack is, or something like that. Um, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, all right. We good on questions for headings? I think we've covered pretty much the basics of how to use them. You cannot use them in email, at least Gmail. Um, just worth noting. Number two, hyperlinks. This one's really easy. Don't just put a URL, whether it's in your email, Word document, online. No, don't do that. <laughs> uh, your Links should be descriptive. Um, again, talking about screen readers, it has to read through the entire document, <coughs> uh, entire document that's put down. So it's like, there is a link to http colon slash slash webaim.org slash techniques slash hypertext slash link text. And that's fine. Like, that's not a particularly long one. I don't know if you've ever looked at a Google Doc URL, but it's ridiculous. Uh, whereas if you just put, Hyperlinks best practices. It's a lot more descriptive. It looks nicer in your email. It looks nicer in your document. Uh, there are only a few instances I've run into where I needed to copy the link versus click on it in today's age. Um, and so that pretty much applies to everything. Um, for those who might not know how to make a link in uh, Word, 
it's the exact same in Google Docs, but you just take your link, whatever you want it to be. You would take the text that you want to make into a link. Um, there's probably a better way to do it. Uh, there's a short key uh, on an Apple. It's Command K, but you can also go to right click hyperlink. You just put it in there, click OK, and it's done. Really easy, really fast. If you ever need to change it, same steps, and it will change your text. Um, please do that. It's just really frustrating if you don't. <laughs> yes? Um, if you ever do have to copy the link, you usually still can, even if it's the hyperlink descriptive text, just by right clicking it. There's usually like copy link location or something like that that will let you still get the actual text of the link itself. Yep. Uh, Usually, I'm pretty sure most programs I've run into, a Google Doc, it just brings up another document. I'm like, oh, click that, copy, paste, let's go. Um, there's, there's always a way to get the link if you need to not click on it. That's links, fast, easy, awesome. Lists. Uh, so when you make a list, whether it's bulleted or you use numbers, most people do this very well <laughs> uh, because it's a lot what word does it automatically is the main reason. Uh, if you put like an asterisk and then your text and then another asterisk and then your text, that's one, it looks messier than just using the word function of making a list. Um, and two, it doesn't tell anybody that it's a list. Uh, so essentially, the long and the short, lists. Use your program to make them. Uh, if you need to change any sort of styling on them, again, it's a lot like what you did with the normal text and the headings. There's another thing on there that says lists, unordered lists and ordered lists. Um, ordered lists have numbers. That's really the difference. Um, I said it applies to Word, email, and web, but there are lots of other different programs that use lists. So please use them. Yes? Sorry, I just had a question about the last line. Uh-huh. Um, can you explain what you mean by out of space after a line? Oh, yeah. So um, in some instances, you might decide that your, I think I have a list on here. Um, maybe your list is too close in space to your next paragraph, or too close to each other, or too far apart from each other. Either way, you want to change the spacing on that. Um, if you go back to the same one that we used before to add spacing before and after, you can do line spacing. So this before and after is the whole list. If you want space before or after the list, um, you can also select uh, don't add space between paragraphs of the same style. It, it automatically selects that, but if you uncheck it, then it will add the space between all of your list items. And so that's just what I'm talking about by use, use the program to add space before and after the lists. Um, if you can click between paragraphs, you could be doing it better. That's essentially what that is all about. OK, so color. Uh, so the one thing that I really want to note about color is that what you think colorblind people see might not actually be what they see. <laughs> um, one really good example, my boyfriend is red-green colorblind. I've heard several different people, even just in like the last couple of years, ask him, oh, so how do you know whether to stop or go at a stoplight? And he's like, well, somebody thought of that. As it turns out, on a stoplight in particular, for him, the red looks a lot like the yellow, actually, um, and the green looks white. So he can very clearly tell the difference between the red and the green on a stoplight. So it's not just take something, make it black and white, and you're, you're showing what everyone sees. It's really helpful, but whenever you can, always try to use a different way to show what you're showing in color. Uh, this really applies to graphs. Um, you know, if you can use 
shapes or different methods of shading in. Um, that is incredibly helpful. Uh, or if you're writing a Word document, maybe using bold and color or italics and color, like doing, doing just color can confuse a portion of the population. Uh, so as an example, I've got, uh, I pulled this off of Twitter like last week. Uh, if you take this graph and just make it black and white, if you really, really try, you can still tell the differences. They're luckily spaced, the lines are spaced far enough apart that it's not a huge issue. But I'm sure you can see how this graph could get really confusing really fast. Um, if you were thinking about color, something that you might decide to do otherwise is either put shapes on the lines or maybe take some of the lines out. Maybe you don't need to show every 10% of this particular graph. Uh, maybe it'd be fine if it went from 60 to 90 or, or like 20 to 40 to 60 to 90. If you take out half the lines, it's easier to read. It still conveys the same information. Uh, this also applies to posters. So this is where I use this a lot. Um, when you have text on colored background, having the contrast be different can, is really important, um, not just for like the effectiveness of your poster, um, but it helps to make sure that you know, it doesn't match or is too close to somebody who might not be able to see color like you do. Um, it also keeps people from having to squint, prevents headaches, et cetera. Um, and we'll go more into how to test for that in just a moment. Do I have any questions on color? Cool. Captions. I'm going to spend almost no time on captions because it's not the focus of today's lecture, but it is very important. If you have a video in your class, caption it. Uh, this is actually, I've looked recently into some of the legal battles, and this is where most universities get in trouble. They don't caption their videos. Uh, and YouTube captions are the worst. <laughs> uh, when it automatically puts on captions, if you look at it, it's pretty much gibberish. Uh, it might give you a vague idea of what the topic is, but it's definitely not helping anybody learn when you have to parse it out piece by piece what somebody's talking about. Um, captions are also really helpful for everybody. Uh, foreign speakers, people with learning disabilities, just listening to a video in a quiet place like the library without headphones. Uh, or even just accessing the information another way. I'm pretty sure at some point everyone here has put, turned the captions on a movie that was particularly quiet or had awful background music that was just like, ah! Uh, you know, it's the same with your videos. It's really helpful for a lot of different people. Um, and so the only other note I want to make about that is that if you do have a student with a disability in your class, Disability Resource Sense Center will uh, do captions of your videos. Uh, however, even if you don't, you can get on like their waiting list. It's not super great, but it also doesn't take terribly long. Uh, I've, when I make any sort of like interview video for the department, I've only made a few to be fair, but it takes maybe 20 minutes for me to caption a three or four minute video. And once it's done, it's done forever. You can actually download those captions if you want to put it on a different platform. You have them right there. So you do it once, it's done. All right, last one, alt text. <laughs> uh, this one is usually forgotten. And it's kind of hard to see on this, but uh, when I'm talking about alt text, you can see kind of right there, it's the text that pops up when you hover over an image. And you can do this in Word, and you can do this in PowerPoint, and it's a feature of PDFs. Um, it describes what the image is saying or the information that's being conveyed. Um, you know, what is the content conveyed by this image? If the link is broken, or if somebody is using a screen reader, or just needs another way to like, maybe they don't understand the graph that they're looking at. I'm sure lots of people have had that issue. <laughs> Uh, using alt text can help you explain that in words. Um, if an image is purely decorative, you don't need alt text. Pretty much every program will tell you you still do, but you don't. <laughs> uh, and while it's used really commonly on websites, it's not just for websites. Uh, 
And in fact, I used webcomic as an example, but webcomics are really, really bad at this. <laughs> they always use the alt text for jokes. Um, and most of them don't have like transcriptions of the comic, so they're just not accessible to people with vision issues at all. All right, so I'm going to show you how to make, how to do alt text. Um, and so we're going to do it in Word, but again, this is the same, or not in Word, in PowerPoint, but it is the same in Word. So when you insert an image, if you right click Format Picture, and go to this box. I don't know what this box is describing, size and properties. Uh, alt text is down here at the bottom. Uh, I guess it's a property. Uh, so you can just put in the title. I usually keep it pretty basic. Um, the description is more important. That's more what we're looking for. This is a comic displaying alt text. Uh, it doesn't have to be long, doesn't have to be complicated. It just describes what is your image. Uh, see and the other thing so it's the same in Word in Google Docs it's close we'll see if okay so unfortunately it is right outside of my window here uh, you can usually see it on your computer but if we click down it is right after the table of contents oh, wait no format oh, right after replace image my bad and return Alt text pops up. I can say this is a picture of me. OK, now it has alt text. And if a screen reader is looking at it or if the image is broken, it can actually be used and the information is still useful. Um, but I just wanted to talk really quickly about tables because, like I said before, tables are kind of tricky. Uh, and this is the main reason I'm going to encourage you guys to download this because I don't want to pull open a table and show you all the tricky, nitpicky details with it. Um, the, most of the six core skills still apply to tables, just in slightly different ways. Um, you can put alt text on a table. Um, try to keep your tables simple wherever possible. Don't merge cells uh, or split cells. I know that's really hard when you're working with large, complex sets of data, but uh, if, if you can, it helps make your information a little bit easier for everyone to understand when they don't have to parse through, okay, this cell over here has two things, this over here has one, what's going on? Um, and then make sure it has a header row. This just explains what this table is about. You already should put them in when you have a table anyways. It's bold part at the top that says this column means this, this column means that. Um, and it's automatically selected when you make a table in Word, probably also in Excel. Um, don't use draw table. I don't know why, but accessible you told me not to use draw table. <laughs> um, and Google Docs does not let you mark a header row. Okay. And now, oh, right. Uh, just so you can see kind of where the header row check mark is if you ever need to check. Accessible PDFs. Uh, like I mentioned before, making an accessible Word or Google Doc is a great way to make an accessible PDF. A lot of the stuff transfers over when you download it. One thing I really want to note, a lot of the PDFs in the world are not accessible, and I blame the Xerox. <laughs> uh, when a Xerox scans your document, it usually scans it as an image, which unless you put alt text on your image describing everything in that document is really not helpful, uh, which I wouldn't expect anybody to do that. There is, however, if you want to scan something and make sure it's readable and searchable, haha, uh, our printer can do that. Just let us know. We can change the settings uh, so that you can make a searchable document. So what makes a PDF accessible? Mainly searchable text, interactive field forms, which we're not going to get into today because they're really complicated and really messy and we just don't have time. Um, navigational aids like a table of contents or bookmarks, which like Steffi pointed out with the Word document, that gets transferred over, so that's automatically there. Um, and following the other six core rules. We're gonna talk really briefly about inserting metadata 
and changing the title view, which are kind of like these special, special things on PDFs that uh, are important. Uh, you can put metadata on pretty much any image, um, but if you go into Adobe Acrobat Pro, everybody who has a university computer has this. It's probably your default PDF opener. Um, but you go to File, Properties, uh, Description, and then this is your metadata. I always click on this button because I don't know what's going on with that. It all looks a lot simpler in here where you have your document title, author, author title, a description of what the PDF is, just something very brief that if you like clicked on the information for a document, it would show you this. That's what the metadata is for. And any keywords that are related to your document. You write those in, hit OK. Uh, and then if you wanted to stop there, you would hit OK again, save, and you're done with the metadata. The other thing I'm going to show you that is a little less intuitive uh, is um, the initial view. Uh, so up here you see it says sept 20th uh, habitual accessibility.pdf. That's all well and good. We can make it a little bit better. Since you already put in your metadata, you just go to show document title, hit OK, and instead up here it shows what your document title is instead of file name x023 dot pdf, which isn't descriptive to anybody. Uh, so if you do that, it will make it so that your document title is the first thing to show. So checking your accessibility. If you want to make sure that your document is actually accessible and you're not just sort of floundering around, um, there are a couple different ways. Uh, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel make it really easy to check. Um, so if I go back to my test document here, go to review, check accessibility. One note, earlier versions of uh, Word for Mac do not have this. Um, it's only Windows, which I think have pretty much always had check accessibility, and newer Macs. Um, I think this is Word 2016 for Mac to give you a perspective. So you click check accessibility, it pops up here. It's like there aren't any issues. Yay, continue on your life. Uh, it does the same thing for PowerPoint. If I go to review, check accessibility, gives me warnings and tips. Uh, I mean, if you've already got a handle on like the, the reading order, I already know because of the template that everything's in correct reading order. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, and my unclear hyperlink text was on purpose. So I'm good. <laughs> um, for Windows, I put the, the information right there because I don't have a Windows computer, so I can't show you that. Um, if we go to Adobe Acrobat again, to review the accessibility on any of your PDFs, you just go to your Find Your Tools over on the side if you start typing in accessibility, this full check will come up. And it's super handy. I usually just don't change anything, just do start checking. And it comes up over here with any issues that I may or may not have. Um, logical reading order, color contrast, needs manual check, those two will always show up. If you do have an issue, so say your primary language hasn't been selected, uh, you just go to whichever one you're having a problem with, right click, and instead of skip rule, it will say fix rule. You fix it, it guides you through it, you save it, yay. <laughs> uh, if, and like I said, if you've made a document accessible, a lot of these things will be good already. Oh, and then if you ever want to check your um, contrast on, on different colors, you go to contrastchecker.com. At least that's my preferred one. There are lots of other ones too. You can either use a, it's called a hex code, for those who don't know, um, and just put in the numbers. Or you can go on here and say, I want to see if red text on a yellow background. OK, I tested that. This tells me if these color differences are up to standards. Um, they all have different criteria. So these two are basically, um, 
for fonts below 18 points. This is, if this is green, you did a good job. If this is green, you did a great job. Um, whereas this is fonts above 18 points, same thing. Good job, great job. Uh, and the color difference, it lets you see in grayscale. So you can see kind of what that looks like. Like, oh, it might not pass the color difference test, but do I think it's close enough? Um, and I, I use that one fairly frequently because I make a lot of posters. Um, so, is it accessible? Round two. Uh, this is one where if you have your computer, you can actually look at these documents and look at what I've done to them. They're all available online. Um, but we're just gonna look really quickly. So we've got plant science internship instructions. Okay, so we've got this document. I'm clicking around for just your benefit. We've got some links on here. Um, is it accessible? Raise your hand if you think yes. Okay, any no's? Can anybody tell me why this is accessible? This is a yes. Yep, we have bullet points down here, headings. And hyperlinks are not just gibberish. And that's kind of the basics for what we need here. I had some issues with the table and what to do with that, but that's what I settled on. <laughs> um, so yes, this document is accessible. Um, can anybody tell me why it needs to be accessible? Yes. Uh, it's for public consumption. The, this is for specifically people who are taking HORT 4096, AGRO 4096W, or HORT 4096W. Uh, we don't know who's gonna take that class. It could change from year to year, from semester to semester. So we need to make sure that everyone who reads this document can access it. All right, this Grover coverage leave plan. Is this accessible? No? Why not? What is it missing that is important for this document? Structure. Structure, that is the big one. It has zero headings. It looks like it could. It's got bolded, but it doesn't have it. Um, would this need to be accessible? I see a shaking of the head back there. And that's correct. It does not have to be accessible. Sam made this to give to Lauren and I and the people in HR who would be taking over her duties so that we could direct people appropriately. None of us have expressed to her that we have accessibility needs, so she doesn't need to make it accessible. But that doesn't mean it won't help. Let's see. Purchase order request form. Okay, so let's see. We've got bookmarks over here. All of this text, I can highlight it, which is a sign that it's not an image. Um, uses tables. Is this accessible? Not that, that's correct. It's got some features of accessibility, but is not quite there. The big one, it uses tables for layout. Um, there's a lot of information in each of these cells. We can't fill out any of these uh, on here. We'd have to print it, fill it out by hand. Um, so as a digital document, it's not considered accessible. Should it be accessible? Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, because who knows who's gonna work in the Hort department. Uh, we've got the slideshow that goes out in the library from a couple, library, lobby, from a couple of weeks ago. Um, this one's a little bit harder, um, but do we think it's accessible? <coughs> yes and no. So depending on its purpose, it would be considered accessible. I made this specifically to use on that TV in the lobby, which means I focused on color and making sure the contrast was good um, and the size of my text. So for its purpose, it is accessible. Um, if I put this document on Google Docs or passed it out to anybody, no, it would be chaos. I just put boxes wherever I wanted to. There's no document structure anywhere. It's all just made to look pretty on a screen. All right, 
final one, Portside Grows Flyer. Our text is selectable. Um, I could do the accessibility check, but that would be cheating. There's also one other sign that I might have made this document accessible. Um, do you remember what it is? The title shows the top. Yeah. <laughs> the title shows up here, uh, which is a pretty good sign. Like, you have to go in and change that manually. It's a pretty good sign that you've made a document accessible, um, or at least taken steps to make it more accessible. You can also do the accessibility check if you've downloaded this document and it will pass with flying colors because I made it. Yep. Uh, again, progress, not perfection. Putting in some of these steps, thinking about the purpose of your document, the audience, will help you make it accessible for your needs. Uh, like I said, accessibility helps a lot in a lot of different documents. There are also some cases, such as with the lobby slideshow, or if I made the lobby slideshow accessible, it would take me forever, and there's no good reason to do it. Uh, so it is okay to think through why you're going to use a document and whether or not it needs to be accessible. Um, start small. Something is better than nothing. And accessibility will never be perfect. There will always be aspects that aren't feasible because of time and your limitations with technology or money or whatever. Um, I also highly recommend, if you're interested in this topic, to go to AccessibleU, accessibility.umn.edu. Uh, they've got tutorials on a lot of different programs, including Moodle and Excel, um, and just all sorts of great things that will help teach you how to make your document accessible. Um, and that is all I have for today. Are there any questions? Yeah. So if you do that manual changing your document title, uh -huh. when you go to save that document, it's still saved under the title that you had. As somebody who like tracks with like document versions and stuff like yeah. that, with like informative names, you're losing like being able to see that name on the document that's open. Only on the document that's open. On your desktop, it will still show your file name. Uh, so it'll show version, final version 23. Uh, <laughs> uh, it just, when you open it up, it will show you the title. Steffi. Do you have any good suggestions from programs to check from web key light like officials? Like not just the contrast checker, but checking the color. So. Yeah. I usually just go with the contrast checker because it, that was the one suggested to me, I guess, and I've really enjoyed it. I also have a tendency just as a person, since my boyfriend is regularly colorblind, I think about that. Uh, so since I've been dating him, I kind of have a tendency to think about that more. Um, I'd say Google. Google might help you out. Yeah. I know that in R, there are colorblind friendly packages for making graphs. Yeah. All right. Well, if you've got any questions, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room knows where to find me. If not, my email is up there. Uh, feel free to send me an email. I'm particularly good with InDesign if anyone has any questions on how to make InDesign documents accessible. So thank you very much.